Well, hello, forensic accountants. Hello from my <coughs> slightly messy kitchen table. Uh, this is the first of a series of uh, videos where I just discuss what is in each of the 17 chapters in the book. So, the um, publisher told me to write an introduction. They wanted something that would be something like a sample of, of what might follow. And this introduction would be put up on the internet and this would essentially be uh, a freebie for anybody that wanted to look at it. I enjoyed writing it. I enjoyed writing the little fable that uh, is there on page one. And I had a, a nice time just totally inventing that little story. So, uh, this is the sequence of the uh, um, topics in the chapter. And in the end, the discussion does actually discuss as opposed to merely summarize. Now, I'll start off by talking about what is forensic analytics. This is the general definition. What I am into is using uh, data collection, data preparation, and then analyzing the data, trying to find fraud, biases, errors, and other types of anomalies. And you know, we have plenty of errors um, in our data. So, this is the outline of the book. Now, there are about eight main themes. Uh, I have 12 uh, little sections over here, but not all of them are a theme of the book. For example, uh, this talks about case studies, and, and these case studies are merely to illustrate that, you know, it happens. This talks about using Access and R for analytics. This talks about using Excel for analytics. So not each one of these blocks is the main theme, but this is what uh, the way we're going to do it. We're going to start with the high level uh, overview tests. We're going to move down to Benford's Law, and then we're going to drill down and drill down to get to finer partitions of what looks odd. Now, in the book, I demonstrate looks like seven various types of software, Excel being our main engine. Excel is the, is, is the favorite among accountants out in the field. Close second being Access. So uh, I have one purchasing card example that will follow right through the chapters uh, all the way till almost the end. The end uh, uh, isn't exactly analytics, it's more a discussion right at the, in, the, in the end chapters. And when it comes to the cases, uh, this you can get from your instructor. There are a series of cases, at least one case for each chapter, sometimes three. And when it comes to the cases, I only use four different data sets. Some of them over there are used sparingly. And the summarable data is used for, looks like, half the chapters. And uh, if any, if you can uh, look over here, you can see that Excel, again, is going to be the main workhorse for uh, us doing the end of chapter cases. To get the end of chapter cases, that you need to get from your instructor. This is the fraud hexagon. It started off as the fraud triangle. And these are the main drivers. What, what, what gives people the uh, incentive and the like to, and the means, to carry out a fraud scheme? And there are several end of chapter questions, um, short questions, that ask which might be the dominant driver or which driver might have been missing. And my only clue to you here is to actually read the definitions in the book uh, on page three, and that way you'll be able to answer those questions correctly. Don't just go by what you think the word means in everyday English. We have three cases in the chapter. Uh, the first one is Ryan Homer was the chief financial officer of Robinson Metals, and this is exactly Robinson Metals' building. You can't see the factory, the factory's in the back. So, uh, Ryan embezzled some 1.2 million. I have some of the checks that I've uh, put into the book, but I also have uh, Ryan's complete uh, list of, of checks, and Ryan makes for a very interesting uh, case study, at least to start. Um, Ryan was the special guest of the ACFE at the Global Conference in June 2018. 
and he actually was the closing speaker at that conference that uh, had an audience of some 3,000 people. So Ryan has been on the big stage. Now, what I did was I looked at Ryan's numbers, and at this stage in the book, I say, you know, if we'd used this test, we could have got it because of these patterns that he used. If we used this test, we could have got it because of these patterns that he used. And so I go through and say, you know, I think we could have caught Ryan had we been running some of the tests that I talk about in the book. Uh, in uh, many emails, uh, we exchanged an email just the other day, in, uh, in our numerous emails, Ryan actually doesn't believe that, um, that uh, analytics by itself could have detected his scheme. Uh, hopefully he changes his mind when he, when he reads this chapter. Um, oops, we don't want to go there yet. There are two other cases. Um, the next one is um, William Rulo from Philadelphia, and he stole quite a lot through various fraud schemes, again, from the city of Philadelphia. And again, I have a sort of a small list for William. If we'd run these various types of tests, we could have got his scheme. The third case is Donna, uh, who was an employee at Georgia Tech, and Donna had a very simple scheme, which I think also could have been detected by reasonably straightforward analytics tests. I then start talking a little bit about Tableau, and I do demonstrate it using this purchasing car data set that runs from chapter to chapter. But let's have a look at Tableau in action here, and this is just a Tableau quickie. So we'll fire it up. The data set that I'm going to haul in now is the City of Somerville data set. And uh, if you look down in the discussion, I will give you a, 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 the full description, this description of the data set. And basically, this is the City of Somerville's check payments for calendar years 2013, 14, 15, and 16. There we say 55,746 checks. Uh, there's some zero checks, and I just want you to leave them as zero checks. Don't treat them as missing. Um, the data source, the original data source, was, of course, the city of Somerville that published its checks. But big thank to, uh, thanks to Professor Wendy Teets for finding the data, parsing it together, doing some cleaning up, adding some extra uh, uh, variables. Uh, she did some good work there, and uh, we all owe her a big thank you. Uh, she has her excellent website, accountingintheheadlines.com. Feel free to go visit that. The data dictionary is uh, that document that describes what is in each of the fields in the data set. We have the amount of the check. that we're gonna, That's what we care about now. We have the check date. We're going to see we're going to use that too. And we're going to care about the main government category, um, they spend on education, general government, or public works. For now, that's all we need to know. Let's go and Tableau is open. Let's go fetch the Excel file. It's here. And this you will also get access to uh, from your instructor. I will, uh, however, give you uh, some details in the, in the um, comments just below the title of the video. Open. Excel and Tableau like to talk to each other. There is the check amount, sorted by date and sorted by check amount descending. Here is the government category, and that's all we need to know for now. Let's just go and do a little exploration with Tableau. New worksheet. Measures. These are usually uh, uh, counts, uh, in this case amount, but it could also be people. This is the field that we can uh, get averages of, total on, do all sorts of uh, uh, sort of arithmetic calculations. These are dimensions, and these are what we would like to filter on, and filter on basically means create subsets, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. We're just going to do a graph of the monthly amounts. I'm going to take amount and send it to rows. You see, it doesn't tell me with a Y axis keeps everything nice. I'm going to take the check date, instead of saying to the y, the x-axis, we go to columns, 
and it only has one column now because it's summing everything but there we go and I really find I don't enjoy these lines although that is the proper way to do a time series data we're just going to change this to bars there we go now I have a bar for each year and we can see which year was the lowest and which year was the highest when it came to actual check payments and now let's just delve in here and first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a total per month but I'm going to add all the Januarys together all the Februarys together all the Marches and so on we we'll just do month over there and here we go so our first little insight is in June the check payments are pretty much double normal so uh, their fiscal year ends at the end of June and so it is possible that they're spending uh, the money in June either it's owed and from accounts payable or it's a case of use it or lose it if you go to their actual financial documents it actually says if they do not spend uh, money that's in the budget it simply reverts to the surplus for that year now Let's go here and let's instead of per month, let's do the 48 months in succession. And I need to click that month there. And now we have 2013 January all the way through to 2016 December. This 2017 means 2017 is actually going to start there, but I have no 27, 2017 data. Again, if we really delved into data, we'll see June, June, June is higher than normal. And October gets a pretty good um, run for its money as well. Watch how small July is. Um, and look how nicely we get the, um, well, I can't point to my pointer, but it says uh, July is small. And there we go, June, nine times is big. Now, let's just go back to this month and we'll do all the Januarys and all the Februarys added together. Uh, this is what I call my periodic graph, and we talk about that in chapter two. Now, we can do a filter. And what I'm going to do here is go to the government category and just drag it there. It's not going to do anything now because I have selected by default all of them. Let's just go and look at education. It was uh, Pink Floyd who said we don't need no education. But generally, you don't need education if you're a superstar rock group. Most of the rest of us do. There we go. Now, this is government uh, category. This is education. And it's rather strange, isn't it? June still gets the biggest bang for the buck, even though it's education and even though the schools are pretty much closed. So it could be a case of doing last minute maintenance and generally a case of use it or lose it let's just try another category and have a look over here uh, we're going to edit the filter and let's go to public works and we'll do okay and isn't that amazing june has disappeared june is no longer king of the months as such and so this is exactly the type of insight that tableau seeks to deliver in the one category of government, June featured prominently, and of course it must also feature prominently if I go to um, um, general government here. We'll do there. And now June is not off the map, but uh, it's pretty much the top of the map. So that's Tableau. We can do new worksheet. We can do new story. I like the software. And we're going to get back to our uh, book here. So this is the purchasing car data. And again, I would have preferred bars. I find them easier to interpret. This is grocery store sales. <clears throat> and we can see that we clearly have a, a seasonal component here. The high points are Sunday of each week. So um, each of these represents a week. And we have biggest days are sundays as such and again this is tableau um in the book again page 18 i talk about why tableau is nice and uh, two things come to mind here tableau is a complete solution you load it everything works unlike 
R. This is R, and this is R Studio. Watch, even for the basic uh, program that I'm running over here, I need to install a package. I need to put the package in the library. I have a whole user library here. Um, these are some recommendations. These aren't all things that I loaded. But R comes with just the bare essentials. And anytime you want to do anything halfway complicated, you need to install a package to get the thing to work properly. And they are competing packages as such. So, eh, not as much fun. This thing about a complete solution is a big advantage. Um, number three. Tableau is valuable when the objective of the analysis is not immediately clear. Oops, sorry about that. Tableau is nice for seek and he shall find or look and just slice and dice and see what pops out. You need to know how to uh, work the controls, but that's why I like Tableau. The chapter ends with a discussion. We'll just look at the top point there. In occupational fraud, it's rather strange, but the victim doesn't know that they are a victim until we discover the whole scheme. And some of the schemes can get really big. Um, I talk about some of them in the book here. There we go. Um, these two schemes, one was 20 million, the other one was 48 million. And again, in one of the, we do the Rita Cronwell story as well, and that was 53 million the dollars can get very big. So I hope you enjoy the introduction. I enjoyed writing it and let's uh, move on and see what's ahead in chapter one. Chapter one being all about Excel. Thank you and bye-bye for now.